Boom! Ton 618, one of the largest black holes in the universe. Woo! Sorry, did that jump scare you? I'm just having such a fun time since we've broken the fourth wall between us, Timmy. Anyway, now that I have your attention, what would happen if we put Ton 618 in our solar system? Or better yet, just extreme space objects in general, like spinning stars of death, the largest star in the universe, or this monstrosity. Come, come with me, Timmy. We need to pick up Kyle and get into space again to find out the answers. By now, I'm sure you've seen that 3i slash Atlas is whizzing past the Earth and other planets at high speeds and has come from outside the solar system, but it has no impact on any planets. So at least we're luckier than the dinos. But this means, yes, other objects in theory could enter our solar system. Yes, Kyle, like perhaps the largest asteroid. Sadly, outside of wiping out all life or murdering Mercury, nothing much else would happen. Even another Jupiter-sized planet would rearrange the solar system, but only over tens to hundreds of thousands of years. That's boring. So, let's first look at what would happen when the extreme versions of every type of star ever discovered enter our home solar system, and indeed, what would happen to Earth. Starting with K and M type stars, otherwise known as red dwarfs and orange dwarfs. Yes, star types are known by letters, and we have a simple way to remember it. Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. Firstly, this ranks all the stars from their temperature and color and size. Secondly, that is not the best pickup line in the world. That slap still hurts. But since my sugar mommy dumped me for spending all her money on Pokemon cards, I'm on the lookout for love once more. You gotta take risks. Much like how the most extreme red dwarf would be a risk to our planet. Meet AD Leonis, one of the most extreme red dwarfs we know of. This thing is tiny just 0.42 times the sun's mass and radius. Yet instead of cute little solar flares, it throws out super flares, dumping more energy in minutes than the sun does in days. Tiny and extreme, like me. Here's the thing though, if this star were to enter the solar system from where Pluto is, the impact would be absolutely minimal. Sure, you'd have a tiny red dot in the night sky, but Earth's temperature, normal, why? because this red dwarf's brightness or luminosity is only 0.02 times that of the sun. So it's like trying to tan with a flashlight, which I have definitely seen Kyle do to me. Before you came along, he was such a whiner. Now he acts tough for you. You've noticed it, haven't you? Yeah. Anyway, this star is still an extreme object powered by fusion. So that means Neptune eventually gets thrown around and Uranus ends up getting tossed right around the sun. Earth might get hit, it might not, who's to say? But if AD Leonis entered the solar system and parked itself around Jupiter instead, Earth wouldn't instantly burn. Temperatures would rise a bit, nights would glow red, and you'd think, oh, maybe this is survivable. But then Jupiter starts orbiting its new star, and then the planet's orbits get absolutely gosh darn f And eventually, Earth's temperatures will go up like 20 degrees as we move towards the Red Dwarf, which doesn't sound bad until you realize that's the language for deserts and dehydration and skeletons. And eventually, AD Leonis gets so close to the sun because it's still the dominant star in the system, and Earth gets thrown into space. So despite the solar flows looking extra massive, that's only because it's a tiny sun bit, and they're only 40,000 kilometers in range. So fortunately, no radiation hits for Earth this time, but we get thrown out. However, maybe a K-type orange dwarf such as Epsilon Eridani might provide that level of destruction I so desire. <laughs> I mean... Um, what? Look over there! Yes, the extreme star is an orange dwarf about 10 light years away, meaning it's slightly bigger, brighter, and more stable than K-types like AD Leonis, which sounds comforting, until you remember it's still way more energetic than the sun has been for billions of years. Epsilon Eridani pumps out strong magnetic storms and frequent flares, and unlike red dwarfs, it doesn't rely purely on surprise randomness, no. Things would be quite different if it entered around Jupiter's orbit. And I don't mean the gravitational slingshotting, way before that even happens. Epsilon's higher brightness starts warming the inner planets, but not too badly. Well, you still get skin cancer, but the real issue comes when the sun's gravitational dominance gets compromised, because this star has a much stronger gravity than a red dwarf. For AD Leonis, it would have taken decades to centuries for our death. But even moving up just a little bit on the star type chart, an Epsilon would hijack the Earth from the sun. And it would look something like this. For a few months, it's cold, then it's hot, hey, then it's nice, and then climates would slide out of range and suddenly Earth isn't burning, but is instead a vanilla scoop of ice cream belonging to no star. Yeah, yeah, be quiet to me. In order for us to get to the largest stuff, I had to at least start off with these stars. Don't worry, I've got a lot planned for you to see and feel. 
as you watch your home planet die over and over and over. What's that, Kyle? You think I'm going too far? Well, maybe. Maybe not. Maybe you should finally get a new girlfriend, hey? How long has it been? 20 videos? Loser. Anyway, Timmy. Hey, yeah. So remember the types of stars I mentioned when we first left Earth? Yeah, we've done K and M. Next up is G, and that's the sun. But having another one of those would be a bit boring, man. Not that extreme. And yes, we have to do the OBF Angle Kiss Me backwards because it starts from the largest and hottest to the smallest and coolest. So that means it's time for Procyon A. Now we're talking. Yeah, this is the eighth brightest star in the night sky and only about 11.46 light years away. It's a yellow white F type star. This means it's 1.5 times the mass of the sun and two times its radius, yet is seven times as bright as the sun. So even if it were out by Pluto, you would notice. No more real nighttime, but that's not so bad overall, unless you hate sleep. Yeah, I love sleep. And so does Kyle, by the way, he sleeps walk through life. If Earth would see both the sun and Procyon in the sky, you'd best have amazing SPF because it would look like this. And that's a lot of radiation. And you're a lot of squishy human. However, if it was in the solar system around Jupiter, its higher luminosity would rapidly raise temperatures across all the inner planets. But how? Well, like a spit roast of the Earth. On one side, the Sun, and the other side, Procyon A. The only place for night owls to exist would be that thin strip of darkness straight down the middle of the planet. Of course, this would only get worse and worse. The ice caps would fail, and the oceans begin losing more water to evaporation, then they can get back to the rain, which can no longer happen due to the heat. I just hope you like eating canned meat, because farming wouldn't be a thing anymore. But don't worry, maybe things will be more crazy with Vega. A white blue A-type star roughly 40 times brighter than the sun that spins so fast it's physically flattened, with its poles thousands of degrees hotter than its equator. If Vega entered the solar system from beyond Neptune, Earth would immediately experience a lot of ultraviolet radiation, damaging the ozone layer and hammering the upper atmosphere even before temperatures noticeably rise. If it were literally any closer, Vega would cook the solar system very aggressively, flooding it with UV light that sterilizes surfaces and rips chemical bonds. You know, the stuff that makes you exist, then the stuff you eat to exist. Also, instead of a thin strip of darkness, get this, you'd have a triangle slice of pizza down the side of the earth covered in darkness. Excuse me, guys. Hello? Ah, hey, Mongolian horse. Oh, of course. Yes, I'll explain, don't worry. So Mongolian horse wanted me to slap you both, not realizing how a star like Vega, that's only just about two times the mass of the sun and almost three times larger, can turn the inner solar system into a bright, dry, radiation-soaked place where life gets evaporated, and yet it's only slightly larger than Procyon A. Does that make sense to you? Of course not, but I will explain. Here's what makes stars even more extreme and weird. The brightness, or luminosity, scales with radius and mass but not directly one-to-one. -one. Yes, yes, I know the equation. Timmy and Kyle don't. We have to keep it simple. Stop calling me. Either get on the ship or stay home. I don't have money for these roaming charges. Anyway, yes, he was right. As always, the larger a star gets, the more its radiation and brightness will increase at exponentially higher rates. Even smaller increases in size will mean ridiculous increases in temperature and brightness. So from now on, this trip is about to get really intense. You better strap in too, Kyle. Let's rock. It's time for P. Cygni, the B-type star. These are typically bluer, but why choose P. Cygni? Because you're basically seeing two lives in one. It's a straight up freak, just like me. It's also 37 times the mass of the sun, so for most of its existence, P. Cygni has indeed lived as the biggest and brightest B-type physically possible. Hot, massive, and absolutely blasting radiation into space that would overtake the entire solar system. Something the Red Dwarf could never do. But P. Cygni is worse than that. It's evolving into a luminous blue variable, which means it's beginning to evolve, causing the star to get larger. So periodically, it goes from being a B-type to expanding outward so far that its surface cools and turns red, each time getting even brighter. How much brighter, you ask? Like 610,000 times brighter than the sun. If B. Cygni were to enter the solar system, Earth wouldn't only heat up, it would be chemically demolished. The ozone layer, you know, the oxygen, wouldn't thin, it would just vanish. Well, it would also immediately begin overheating everything from about even 100 AU away, and then it would suck in its entire solar system due to its immensely powerful gravity. 
While the Earth would be a thousand degrees within literally days to weeks, yes, even from the distance. No, oh, you want to survive this star, Timmy? You too, Kyle? You poor babies. Well, the habitable zone would have to be able to sustain that 610,000 times brightness, so we'd have to be about 789 AU away. Then a year would last 4,000 years. Yeah, 4,000 years to go around the star one time. And that wasn't even the most extreme type of main sequence star. Yes, all the extreme stars we're looking at, they're in the main sequence. That means they aren't baby stars and they aren't all the giants. And the biggest, hottest, and most unstable main sequence stars in the known verse are O-types. And they're actually born this way. Not like the other giants, you only get to the size when they're old. They are so extreme on classification charts, they literally edge it. Their surface temperature is over 40,000 degrees. Luminosity from 200,000 times to millions of times brighter than the sun. Sounds familiar? Yeah, P. Cygni is actually borderline an O-type, but true O-types go even crazier. From Eta Carinae B being in 1,000 times the size of the sun and immediately burning the entire solar system alive within literally seconds, to R136A1 being the most massive star we know of, yet being quite small. It'll still suck the entire solar system from any distance because of its incredible gravity. Even one like Zeta Puppis, which is shedding its skin at 2,500 kilometers per second, would fill space with dense, heated gas that would slam into the protective shell of the Earth and then collapse it. Like that time I collapsed after getting lipo for my 8-pack. If it didn't, you know, kill everything first. Yeah, I'm talking about the star. Well, that's it, Kyle and Timmy. Each star type gets hotter, bigger, brighter, exponentially. But that's only when they're fusing hydrogen into helium. That's what defines a star being on the main sequence. So what about when they're fusing other elements because they're on their way to death? And what happens when they're just born? Yes, I have even more extreme space objects to show you. Not that Kyle deserves it after what he said. Wait, what's it, Timmy? You think he's innocent? He told the sugar mommy about the Pokemon cards. I'm glad I have at least one true friend in Mongolian horse. Ha. Anyway, stars exist because fusion pushes outward while gravity pushes inward, right? When hydrogen runs out, that balance breaks. The core contracts, the outer layers explode outward, and the star becomes a giant or supergiant. Those are cooler on the surface, but are also enormous hundreds to over thousands of times the sun's radius. If one of these red supergiants entered the solar system, obviously Earth would be slowly roasted by intense infrared radiation, but the real danger is scale. These stars are so large that simply passing through the inner solar system would physically engulf the entire inner solar system, especially something like V.Y. Canis Majoris. Just look at that monster. 1,420 times the radius of the sun. Wow. However, the good news is, is that I can tell you about something you've probably never heard of. A yellow hypergiant. That's right, I said yellow, like a banana. Sadly, I can't eat them anymore. I had a, I had a bad experience. Just like you will with HR5171. Yes, it's a red giant, but yellow, because it's a bit hotter. It's a temporary phase from when a blue giant is evolving to a red giant, and this is what makes it insanely rare. And this one is also eating a fellow star, and that makes them look like this weird peanut shape. We'd just about be swiped out of existence if that flew into the solar system, obviously. But what about a baby star rather than these grandfatherly almost dead stars? Here's DJ Tori. This is a newborn star still violently pulling itself together. It's obviously smaller than the sun, but surrounded by an accretion disk that fires powerful plasma jets driven by extreme magnetic fields. If it entered the solar system, the danger would be we either drown in its accretion disk gas or get beam blasted by a piss missile. Yeah, I said it. What? You don't drink enough water and have a strong enough prostate to relieve yourself with purpose? Come on, Kyle. Get your life together, man. Eat fiber, hydrate, or you're gonna die as pasty face and gaunt as you lived. Actually, that reminds me of the most extreme white dwarf. REJO317853. This is the exposed core of a dead red giant with about the sun's mass crushed into something the size of Earth. Basically, the largest white dwarf physics allows at 1.36 solar masses. This one, though, spins insanely fast and has a magnetic field so strong, it accelerates electrons to near light speed, firing pulsed radiation beams like a lighthouse. If it entered the solar system between the sun and the Earth, Earth wouldn't be warmed, it would be rhythmically shocked with repeat radiation blasts that fry satellites 
shred organics, unzip DNA, and flip the planet between survivable and lethal conditions every few minutes. Like the Death Star, but targeted exclusively at light. And if the crab pulsar entered, same idea, just vastly worse. A pulsar is the crushed core of a massive star, only 20 kilometers wide, but heavier than the sun, spinning dozens of times per second, even hundreds. Its radiation beams are millions of times more powerful than a white dwarf. If one swept across Earth, well, the surface would be instantly sterilized and the atmosphere destroyed. Also, its gravity is so incredibly powerful, it would make what the Red Dwarf did to the solar system feel like a PG version of an R-rated apocalyptic movie. And finally, I know, Timmy, you want to see what would happen if a rogue black hole would fly by the solar system and enter it. I can do you one better to get that outcome. This is NGC 6946 BH1, the star that failed supernova and turned straight into a black hole. Maybe. Yes, NGC 6946 was a red supergiant that didn't explode into a supernova. It was meant to, but instead it simply collapsed and vanished, forming a black hole immediately and with a small hesitation. Humans were even observing this until 2015 when it disappeared, literally gone from all telescopes. If such a star entered the solar system at a safe distance, Earth would first experience intense heating and be prepared to die, but perhaps, you know, it would be okay, depending on the distance. But then, without warning, the star would just disappear, replaced by an invisible black hole. And then, of course, that black hole would just tear apart the entire solar system over time. And that wouldn't be a long time. And that's not even the most bizarre space object ever found. 